Hi everyone, today we're going to be looking at The Black Cottage by Robert Frost, but before we get into the analysis, I do want to preface this video by apologising if it's sort of all over the place. This is the hardest poem of Frost's that I've had to study so far. It's really long and there's not many resources online about it. Um, however, after many weeks of pondering over it, I think I figured out what I think it means to me. So hopefully there'll be some kind of some kind of helpful material for you in this video. Uh, but we'll just we'll just see how it goes. Okay, let's get into it. First of all, let's go through what happens in this poem. So it follows a narrator and a minister who are walking together and they come across an abandoned black cottage. Then the minister starts talking about the lady who used to live there before she died. Her sons have kept the house for sentimental value and they promise to visit it once a year, but they never have. The woman talked frequently about war, particularly the American Civil War in which her husband died. He either died at the Battle of Gettysburg or Fredericksburg, but the minister can't remember. She lived alone there after her husband died and her sons left. They did this because they were not close to their mother. And the minister thinks that the house is eerie because everyone's forgotten about it. The woman had Puritan beliefs and she stood by freedom and equality. Unlike the kind of uncertainty and the conflict and just the complications of perspectives today. The minister talks of how he almost changed the creed or the doctrine of the church in order to fit with the younger members view of the world but he didn't because of her. So then he starts to kind of outline this perspective that he's got inspired by this old woman. So he says, truths go in and out of fashion. Um, and that's what we call change in our society. But that doesn't mean that you stop believing in truths. He thinks that you should stick by your beliefs like the lady did. He says he wishes he could set up his own kingdom in an isolated desert where there would be no problem of dealing with change in society. There would be no one to force change on his community, as he puts it. Then, however, in the middle of describing this utopian society that he's dreamed up, he's distracted by some bees which are in the walls of the house, and both of the men leave, and we finish on an image of a blazing sunset. I'm not actually going to go through this poem line by line like I usually do, I'm going to go through it in terms of subject, so the different themes and the different characters, just because it's so long and there's not many techniques or anything like that to analyse. So we're going to start with the thing that the poem is named after, the cottage. So to give some context to the, the different characteristics of the house, I suppose, that I'm about to go through, um, let's talk about what the house represents. So. I think the house represents the woman who lived in it, um, but particularly her views. She had very Puritan views, so this whole atmosphere of the house decaying and being forgotten represents how Puritanism and this woman's views and experiences are just decaying and they've been forgotten. But before we get any deeper into that, I think we should go over how these themes are displayed in the poem. So first of all, there's the title, The Black Cottage, and this is an oxymoronic sentence because black has connotations of mystery and death, whereas cottage is full of life and it's familiar. So I think this contradiction already sets up this sense of mystery. You know, there's something about the house that we don't really know. Then in the first line, the narrator says, we chanced in passing by that afternoon. And that's quite significant, I think, because it shows how much this house has been forgotten. Even these two guys, even the minister who seems to know so much about this woman and had quite a good relationship with her, even he only passes by her house by chance. And also in line 38, the minister says that the cottage was forsaken even before it was abandoned. So forsaken means kind of lonely and forlorn and doomed, I suppose. So I think that really, again, gets up this sense of mystery and it makes us feel like there's something about the house or the happenings in the house or whatever the house represents that we don't quite know about yet. For more development on this spooky, mysterious theme, 
there are the lines, among tar-banded ancient cherry trees, set well back from the road in rank lodged grass, fresh painted by a shower of velvet black. You can see how there's so many kind of dark colours in this visual sequence. So the rain has made the cottage black, there's grey weather from the rain. <laughs> uh, the cherry trees have very dark barks and there is this overgrown grass. So yeah, a very spooky atmosphere surrounding it. And it's also worth pointing out that the cottage is set well back from the road. So it's set apart and I think that represents how the woman was isolated, both physically and mentally. Inside the house too, the imagery is pretty depressing. We have a button-haired cloth lounge spread scrolling arms under a crayon portrait on the wall, done sadly from an old daguerreotype. These doorsteps seldom have a visitor. The warping boards pull out their own old nails, with none to tread and put them back in their place. A daguerreotype is an old, outdated way of taking photos, um, but that's not really important, I just thought I would define that. What is important is the word sadly, which describes how the painting was done, and I think this just contributes to how this entire house is just characterised by loss and grief and loneliness. And as we will see later, that is the same for the old woman. There's also a personification of the house in the way that it's quite self-destructive towards itself. We can see the nails are tearing themselves apart. And that's just quite a sad image. And I think that the fact that it's personified and shown in this way, it's, it's more powerful. It gives more weight to this abandonment. Because if it was just said that the walls were coming out, we wouldn't have any emotional reaction to that. So yes, I think that the fact that the house is isolated represents how the woman was isolated. I think the fact that the house is abandoned represents how the woman and her views have been forgotten. But another thing is the fact that it's so spooky. And I think that kind of serves to emphasise this theme of the forgottenness of her views so her views seem so alien now and I think that things that are so far from what we know always seem scary on some level so that's why Frost has made it seem so spooky because he's not trying to say that her views were evil and we should be scared of them but he's saying that they seem scary because they're so far from what we know now because when we actually look deeper I definitely don't think he's trying to say the woman is evil. She seemed like a relatively nice woman. She had lots of, you know, healthy beliefs. And again, this goes back to the image of the black cottage. A cottage is something that is reassuring and familiar, but now it's become something that's run down and spooky. And I think that's the same for the woman, metaphorically. Another major theme of this poem is the American Civil War. It's alluded to quite a lot throughout the poem, one of which is when the minister talks about how the woman's husband died. He says, He fell at Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. I ought to know. It makes a difference which. Fredericksburg wasn't Gettysburg, of course. Gettysburg and Fredericksburg were both battles in the American Civil War, and it's apparent from the poem that the woman's husband was fighting on the Union side, which was the northern side of the United States, fighting for the freedom of the slaves and for unity between all of the states. Later it also says, She had seen Garrison and Whittier, and had her story of them. John Whittier and William Lloyd Garrison were both advocates for the abolition of slavery. I don't think that any of these allusions to the Civil War are really trying to tell you anything deep about the woman or about the subject matter of the poem. I think a lot they are just trying to cement this woman's views in the past. And they also give a little bit more context on her views when we look at these next lines. One wasn't long in learning that she thought whatever else the Civil War was for, it wasn't just to keep the states together, nor just to free the slaves, though it did both. She wouldn't have believed in those ends enough to have given outright for them all she gave. 
Her giving somehow touched the principle that all men are created free and equal. That's a hard mystery of Jefferson's. What did he mean? Of course, the easy way is to decide it simply isn't true. It may not be. I heard a fellow say so. But never mind. The Welshman got it planted where it will trouble us a thousand years. Each age will have to reconsider it. Okay, lots to talk about with these lines. Jefferson and the Welshman are both referring to Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States. And he is famous for promoting individual liberty, for being one of the founding fathers of the US, and the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. He believed that the f- government shouldn't have too much power over people. So here in these lines, there's a lot of talk about his famous statement that all men are created equal. The fellow that is being referred to is supposedly George Santayana, um, from what I read online. <laughs> um, so this was a real man who was very critical of Puritanism and the values that American society was basically built on. He was a well-educated and brilliant philosopher, but he failed utterly to comprehend Jefferson's quote, and instead he chooses what is said in the poem as the easy way to just say that this statement is not true. And this is really interesting because this really isolated and simple-minded old woman in the poem understands and accepts this hard mystery really easily in contrast to this you know really intellectual guy and i think the reason for this is because the old woman believes in order to understand whereas santayana made his rational understanding the measure of his belief and frost is sort of saying in this poem that he doesn't think that's the way to go um he saw new england as doing the same for america as puritan does for religion He thinks it keeps it grounded in fundamental beliefs and gives it meaning. So this means he shared the belief of the old woman. Religious belief creates order with which to comprehend the world. So he was often seen as anti-intellectual because of this. He prized values and morals over knowledge. And he believed that Santayana was disillusioned and that Santayana was wrong for trying to analyze or change these beliefs. One more thing that is quite interesting here is what the minister says about each age having to reconsider it. I really like this quote because it really has proved true, you know? Equality is still such a huge issue in our society. And I suppose this is just Frost pointing out how important this issue is to the overall message of the poem, which of course we're going to get to. (laughs) Okay, I know I just said earlier that I thought the main prevalence of the Civil War was to put the woman's views in the past, uh, but I've actually changed my mind just in the recording of this narration. I told you this would be all over the place. So I actually think that the war kind of represents this turning point in Frost's view of when things started to get overcomplicated because before the war people stuck to their fundamental values like the old lady but now they're caught up in contemporary issues there's more emphasis today on knowledge of present issues or the truths that are in fashion rather than moral values or the truths that are actually important so i'm going to go into this a little bit deeper when i talk about truth as a theme later on But for now, let's move on to the old lady as a character. I definitely think that the old lady is a morally good character in this poem. That is how she is presented. Maybe not in the eyes of the minister, but overall, I do get the impression that Frost thought she was kind of the model for how people should behave. And the minister did think this as well, but he kind of interprets it wrong. But we'll get into that when we talk about him. So the old lady was a Puritan, which I know I've said a lot (laughs) so far. um, But the definition of that means that she adheres to simpler but stricter religious views than most people. She has this real simple faith and innocence, which today is lost. She isn't caught up in the current political situation. 
she has kind of stuck to her old fundamental values. So there's proof of this in the quote, you couldn't tell her what the West was saying and what the South to her serene belief. She had some art of hearing and yet not hearing the latter wisdom of the world. She does seem to be more connected to issues of society when we talk about the civil war. But again, there's a sense of detachment because it says she didn't just believe in the civil war to free the slaves or to unite the states. It says she wouldn't have believed in those ends enough to have given outright for them all she gave. Her giving somehow touched the principle that all men are created free and equal. She knew what the war was about and she supported it because it supported her values and I think her values were definitely ahead of her time, you know, she believed in equality for all races. But there's a real irony here because time has now overtaken her and forgotten her. So I think you can start to see how she is presented as a model for a wise person in this poem, especially from a religious viewpoint, because she doesn't let her personal ties or her personal investment in things or in or contemporary opinions and contemporary viewpoints and pressures and all that, she doesn't let that distract from her true fundamental values. And I think maybe that's what Frost was referring to when he talked about the considerate neglect that she taught her children. Not that she didn't love them, but I suppose her love for God was greater or something. So let's go back to this belief about equality for all the races. The quote is, white was the only race she ever knew, black she had scarcely seen, and yellow never. But how could they be made so very unlike by the same hand working in the same stuff? She had supposed the war had decided that. We really see here that her belief was not grounded in proof, kind of like someone like Santayana's beliefs would have been. Her loyalty to her beliefs and the simplicity of those beliefs is contrasted with the youth of today who are just really confused and their beliefs are so overcomplicated by a general onslaught. So I think that the woman is almost being compared to a child um, in this whole analogy because the youth we can say are kind of like teenagers and people in their early 20s and things like that. But the woman who is explicitly um, compared to a child, when the minister says, suppose she had missed it from the creed as a child misses the unsaid goodnight and falls asleep with heartache. And I think that in this way, Frost is trying to show how innocent she is, how naive and uneducated with simple ideas, but in a way that is pure and unstained and true to the human default, I suppose, not kind of messed up by society yet <laughs> and also just to go full circle with what I said about the house and how it represents her we don't know her name or anything much about her so a lot of the information we get about her I think is implied through the house so there's a real sense of mystery about the house and decay which we've already talked about which creates this atmosphere of her being so forgotten of her beliefs being so forgotten that they now seem alien and a little intimidating. Moving on to a character who I think is very much in contrast to the old woman, let's talk about the minister. So the old woman can be kind of summarised as this progressive lady who is now forgotten, but the minister is more of a conservative man who is afraid of change and is now in authority. He's also kind of a contradiction with himself because he's the man who remembers the old lady the most but his speech and the attitude that he has while he's saying it contribute to the message that she has been forgotten the minister clearly admires her principles in one quote he says what are you going to do with such a person strange how such innocence gets its own way i shouldn't be surprised if in this world it were the force that would at last prevail but i think that the minister is very caught up in modern life and the pressures of new beliefs, that he kind of remembers her principles wrong and he exaggerates them to the point of being counterproductive. I think she focused on sticking to her fundamental beliefs 
Whereas he's focusing on not changing and they sound like they're the same thing, but they're really not. Also, the old woman lived out her values, whereas the minister is very superficial about it. He only fantasizes about them in this impossible utopian dream. And I think that contributes to the idea that he's more cynical. He is slightly condescending of her in his speech. He compares her to a child and he says that her phrases are quaint. This means old-fashioned or sort of nostalgically attractive. He's also grateful for her inspiring him to live the way he does. He describes a scene in which he was almost overtaken by the modern beliefs, you know, the modern kind of loads of viewpoints that are getting thrown around and he wanted to change the creed of the church. So I'm just going to read this. Do you know, but for her, there was a time when to please younger members of the church, I would have changed the creed a very little. Not that she ever had to ask me to. It never got so far as that. But the bare thought of her old tremulous bonnet in the pew and of her half asleep was too much for me. Why, I might wake her up and startle her. It was the words descended into Hades that seemed too pagan to our liberal youth. You know they suffered from a general onslaught. And well, if they weren't true, why keep right on saying them like the heathen? We could drop them. Only there was the bonnet in the pew. I'm just as glad she made me keep hands off. For, dear me, why abandon a belief merely because it ceases to be true? So yeah, in this way he is admiring of the old lady, but he is out of touch with the real her. I think he defines his definition of true too much according to society, and that's why he wants to create this whole other society in order to keep truth alive. Whereas the woman was less insecure in her belief. She could just believe things and live slightly isolated from everyone and just go about her life. So he tells us about this utopian society that he sometimes dreams of. It is a desert walled by mountain ranges half in summer snow. And if you examine this, this is a very contradictory climate. Deserts don't ever go next to mountains with snow on them, especially not in the summer. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think that shows how impossible this vision is. And then, of course, his whole supposedly passionate description of this amazing society he wants to create is interrupted by some bees. I think the bees represent the real world and how, yeah, the minister is just too much involved in society and the modern world that he can't really think about all this stuff because, yeah, he keeps getting distracted. We have to realise that this poem could have been written from the minister's point of view. It's mainly his speech, so the, the narration wasn't really needed. But I think this is really important because Frost wanted us to know that this is just a perspective. It's not the truth. Um, and in this way, we can see everything that is put forward in the poem as a perspective. And you kind of have to decide for yourself what you think was the right one. I personally think that Frost himself thought that the right perspective or the best of the three anyway was uh, the old woman's. And thus, I think that was kind of his intention with this poem to show that the right belief has sort of been forgotten and molded into something else in the case of the minister. And he thinks, you know, society is going going a bad way, honestly. It's, it's a pretty deep poem. <laughs> um, and he thinks that we should all be more like the old woman. So to summarise all this, I think that on the surface, the Black Cottage is... A historical lesson about respecting your elders and remembering the Civil War. But more deeply, it's really examining human nature and the nature of societies in the way that our fear of change and also just the progression of time can mean that old but right and fundamental morals become forgotten, at least in the case of wider society. But it's not black and white. It's not like in the past it was good. In the present, it's bad um, because these morals can also be misinterpreted. So I think that, yeah, 
it's 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 very complicated this poem um i mean this is just my interpretation of what it all means but yeah i would say that it's saying that the present view is that things change whereas the view held by the minister is that truths go in and out of fashion which and we should stop changing and we should value all truths but neither of these are right in frost's eyes anyway the view held by the old lady is what he thinks is right and that is that we should stick to morals which are the important truths hopefully that makes a bit of sense that's what i interpret this poem to mean anyway so in this line of thinking i think i just want to talk a little bit more about the theme of being forgotten i think that change being forgotten kind of the past versus the present and different perspectives these are all kind of the themes of this poem so being forgotten is presented through the irony of a woman who was ahead of her times but has now been overtaken by the times it is also shown through um, the abandoned house which re represents the woman and her views and the sunset at the end of the poem i haven't mentioned that yet i think that represents kind of the end of people's memories of the woman um, and her beliefs and also the way that the minister mixes up the battles like people just don't even remember the war anymore when he's talking about the old woman grieving her husband talking about the war in which he died and going to the painting um, of him in her house he says i doubt if such unlifelike lines kept power to stir anything in her after all the years he thinks that just because it's a bad painting she won't care anymore i think this shows how people are already forgetting the immense loss that came with the civil war all right hopefully you have learned a bit more about what this poem might mean from all my ramblings but i'm just going to finish this off with something a little less deep and we're just going to talk about the form of the poem most of these things i've mentioned already but i thought i should put them all in one place so this poem has no rhyme scheme or fixed meter um, there is personification of the house to give more weight to the abandonment of it with no one to visit it or keep it company the house is destructive towards itself it's tearing itself apart and and the fact that it's personified in its abandonment gives it that emotional weight because we can perhaps empathize with that or at least sympathize with it whereas it's it's harder to empathize with just a an object <laughs> or a house then there is lots of metaphors there's the metaphor of the the house um and i think the war as well to represent the old woman and actually the old woman herself is a bit of a metaphor for puritanism or for the beliefs that she held and how they're all now forgotten they're all dead and they're all neglected and all that kind of stuff then we have visual imagery of dark colors around the house to showcase its spooky neglect um, and we have dialogue to show that the minister's point of view is just a point of view he comes across as rather cynical he's quite rambling and forgetful um, and i think this is really good characterization there are also references to real people and real events um, and just some kind of rambling off on things to make this sound like a real conversation i think the minister's dialogue is quite convincing then within the minister's utopian dream there are con contradictory climates which i think are a metaphor for the ridiculousness of this vision and it's also interrupted by the bees which represent the harsh and the real world and finally there is irony in the woman who was ahead of her times who is now forgotten so this really emphasizes how far from the fundamental values that we should have that society has gotten frost is yeah really trying to show us that we've gone wrong and we need to fix stuff okay that was my rather scattered analysis of the black cottage by robert frost i hope it helped